We are ready to begin. Chinese companies are on a spending spree. More than 36 years ago, China opened its economy to the world. And now, for the first time in its history, China's overseas investments are on the brink of surpassing foreign direct investment. A role reversal on a global scale. Overseas Chinese investment is on track to exceed 120 billion US dollars. Beijing's support with its decreased regulations and a slowing domestic economy are helping to fuel investments from Africa to the United States. The tradition of Chinese state-owned companies investing in energy is shifting as more private players are putting their money into the likes of real estate and technology. China's investments are bringing new opportunities, but are also delivering challenges. Political risks, legal barriers, and cultural misunderstandings. So as Chinese companies continue to pursue acquisitions overseas, what is China's impact as a global investor? Welcome to the Sai Xin Debate from Davos. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see all of you here sharing our interest in such a fascinating question. China's impact as a global investor. I'm Hu Shu Li, editor of Caixin Media. Caixin is a powerful financial news organization in China, offering content across, uh, across a, a range of platforms video, digital, and print. We are well known for being passionate champions of journalism, and we want to be a bridge between China and the world. We, are, we will be using today's debate on all of our platforms. But our primary language is Mandarin, so please take your headsets as I will switch to Chinese. We know internationalization of Chinese companies is accelerating at the APEC meeting last year. The leaders of China said that in the next 10 years, we would invest 1.5 trillion US dollars. We know this is not a new topic, but it's heating up. So, what is, where are they? What are the challenges? At the end, what will be the impact of that investment on the rest of the world? Those are the subjects for today. In other words, we are looking forward towards a new situation. I would like to do it in three parts. The first part is where are we now? What are the priorities and trends? The second part is challenges we are facing, but of course uh, opportunities as well. The third part is the impact on industrial structures of uh, destination countries. Let me introduce my panelists today. Perhaps I can start from the left. Mr. Cai Jingyong, he is uh, CEO of uh, International Finance Corporation, an expert. Three years ago, he was uh, CEO of IFC uh, and has been since then. He travels between the US and many developing countries. He has his fingers on the pulse of our Chinese overseas investment. So let me start with uh, then uh, Chinese uh, panelists. Mr. Lin Yifu, he's a leading economist. He used to be chief economist of the World Bank. Now he's a professor at Beijing University. Uh, Dou Mingzhu, she is a chairman of Gurli Gri. It's one of the leading white appliances manufacturers in China. It's the biggest also in the world of white appliances manufacturing. She is a representative of Chinese companies here. Next. Uh, 
is Minister of Trade and uh, Industry of South Africa, Rob Davis. 2014 was uh, the South Africa year in China, and they then did the year of China. Uh, South Africa welcomes Chinese investment to help their economy succeed in its transition. So we look forward to hearing his views. The next speaker is Bob Diamond, ex-CEO of uh, the Barclays Bank. He's now working at a merchant capital. He founded the company and is the CEO. He'll be talking about Chinese investment overseas from a practitioner's point of view. We know they have very large investment in Africa. The last, but not the least, perhaps many Chinese audience uh, know about him. He's the Francisco Gonzalez. He is CEO of Mexican Trade and Investment Promotion Association. This is a trade promotion organization he works for. Professor Gonzalez is a professor of finance. He used to be commercial counselor in China and uh, ambassador of Mexico to Germany. Clearly, he's an uh, expert in international economics. Now, let's uh, start. The first round of questions will be focused around the fact that the Chinese companies are accelerating in their investment. So where are they now? We know this is not a new subject, but it is at a new stage because earlier China focused on developing countries to develop its pockets, and now the focus is shifting towards the developed countries. Is this a new trend? I would like also to know what is special about this new trend. Perhaps we could start from Mr. Tsai Jingyong. Then we will uh, speak uh, in turn. Indeed, this is a new trend. Uh, in China, this is known as uh, going out of China, going global. At an early stage, it was focusing on oil and minerals. The change is that uh, investment is now going into developed countries. Uh, even in developing countries, there are different models of investment. This is a reflection of the gradually more mature economy in China, and Chinese brands are becoming more attractive. Given that, there are many opportunities for Chinese companies, as well as challenges. I'm sure we'll talk about those. But what I'm focusing on is the developing countries, particularly in Africa. Uh, there has been uh, Chinese investment playing a major role, causing controversies, too. I've uh, our friend from Mexico, perhaps you could uh, tell us what you think. Thank you very much. Uh, I can tell you that we see in Mexico really a very fast change in the way China is investing. At the very beginning, there was the raw material, as you said, and it was mostly in South America. After that, China moved to the infrastructure and also to the manufacturing, buying existing companies abroad. And what we see now in Mexico is there are Chinese companies with Chinese trademarks investing in Mexico so they can expand the market in the NAFTA area and in Latin America. Then we have seen these four stages of the Chinese investment, also very much with uh, what said the, the global uh, and corporate governance. And this is a really nice way of dealing in this new way that China invests. OK, thank you. Uh, Domingo, you are the earliest investing in Brazil, starting at the beginning of the century, and uh, perhaps the year before you set up uh, manufacturing facilities in the U.S., and also you're going to Vietnam. I'm just wondering why you have uh, moved around like this. But is it due to your particular experience? Well, in Brazil, we 
had a market there. There was demand. Our positioning was to sell our own brands. So we sell domestic appliances. For 10 years running, we are number one in sales around the world. But it's still domestic appliances. But through our own research, we have developed new products. Uh, our uh, range of products has been broadened, not just uh, domestic, but also commercial appliances now. These are proprietary development. Therefore, our technology is already showing better properties. So we want to serve the rest of the world with property, uh, with technology. So uh, our, the, our plant was shut down after three years. It was because of the investment environment. To us, we do need to consider risk. The reason we withdrew was because the risk was beyond our control. In Europe, we are considering setting up manufacturing facilities. It's not simply to uh, put on our label there. What is more important is to grow with the local economy. We feel we have the capacity and capability now, uh, because uh, what we uh, bring to other countries now is uh, technology, for example, central uh, refrigeration system or air conditioning system. We do not use electricity but we use a photovoltaic power, heat, wind. We use new energy to power central air conditioning system now. And therefore, with new and advanced technology, we are already a step ahead of our competitors. It's no longer like in the past when we were just investing to produce, but we are now servicing now. In other words, you feel that there are opportunities even in developed markets. Yes, indeed, uh, in the US, we sell GRI as a brand. It's well recognized. Uh, Lin Yifu, uh, I'm keen to hear your views. Chinese investment overseas uh, traditionally has been of three types. One is for resources, because uh, China is a fast developing country and uh, do not does not have enough resources itself. Secondly, infrastructure, because China has competitive advantage. Developing countries all need infrastructure. The third is to enter the local market. Investing locally, you'll be able to overcome um, tariff barriers. But these three types are all mutually beneficial. Looking ahead, I think there are two new, increasingly more important types of overseas investment. One is to go into developed countries to acquire technology. China needs to continue to develop. It needs uh, technology innovation and upgrading. In, in many industries, we are still behind compared with developed countries. Overseas acquisition or acquisition of a patent will help us to accelerate our own technology. We know developed countries will welcome that too, because since the crisis of the 19, 2008, economy has been struggling. Therefore, developed countries welcome foreign direct investment, including from China, including investment acquiring technology. Apart from that, I would like just to highlight one more thing. The labor-intensive industries in China are now under pressure from increased cost of labor, rather like the 60s in Japan when it moved its manufacturing to Asian countries, creating the Four Tigers. Great. In the 80s, the Four Tigers moved their manufacturing to China. That's helped China to become the manufacturing plant of the world in the last 30 years. Now China is reaching the stage Japan did in the 60s and the Four Tigers uh, in the 80s, because the cost of labor is increasing very fast in China. Labor-intensive industries in China are now real, under real pressure to move out of China. I would like to say that this is a 
Very good thing for other developing countries. This will increase their employment, export, and income. It's a great opportunity. On that, if you look at the trend, Japan in the 60s, Asian tigers in the 80s have all gone through this period, but there's a difference in quantity. In the 60s, the manufacturing sector in Japan employed 9.7 million people. In the 1980s, the careers, uh, the total employment is 2.8. 3 million. And uh, now the Chinese uh, total employment, according to the third uh, poll on the economy, is uh, uh, 12 billion. Uh, so I think it is uh, 12 times uh, than the, uh, those countries seen before. So very possibly uh, in the uh, labor-intensive industries, when it shifted to development, uh, to developing countries, it will have a, a new wave of the uh, industrialization, and this will be a win-win situation, and that, that is very encouraging. So what's the opinion of the uh, Minister Davis? No, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think I should say that from a South African point of view, since uh, 2008, uh, China has been our largest trading partner, both uh, uh, for uh, exports and imports. But the investment relationship uh, is still one where uh, China is behind uh, OECD countries, and even countries like India have a, a larger quantum of uh, foreign direct investment. And even actually at this moment in time, the value of South African investment in China is larger than the value of Chinese investment in South Africa, although there are more Chinese companies involved in South Africa than there are South African companies involved in China. But we are seeing a, a very important uh, structural change, and I think that is a change that we've been working energetically with uh, the Chinese government, with the Chinese private sector to bring about. And it is the one that I think has been described here. Uh, a lot of the uh, investment in the earlier period was around extractive industries, mining projects and things of that sort. Uh, there was one significant uh, exception, the, one of the largest uh, foreign investments by China at the time was a, a joint venture with the South African Bank, uh, also to finance uh, Chinese projects on the African continent. But now we've seen a number of Chinese companies actually investing in, uh, in uh, manufacturing, foreign direct investment, bringing in their own brands. I think one of the high watermarks was the uh, opening last year of the first auto works plant, uh, automotive uh, products. There's another uh, Beijing auto works plant as well. Uh, we've seen uh, Chinese uh, television manufacturing. Uh, there's quite a significant presence in uh, uh, manufacturing of, uh, pro of uh, products for the, uh, the green economy, uh, particularly energy generation generation and energy saving uh, projects. Uh, and I think that uh, all of this does indicate that there is a change in the pattern. Uh, and I think this uh, qualitative change is what we want to see because uh, as uh, China itself is making structural changes in the economy, and I think Justin Lin was alluding to that just now, as China is focusing on the uh, quality of growth, uh, is moving towards inclusive growth, so is the African continent. And uh, a critical element of that is that we need to occupy a much more uh, space of value addition and industrialization. So I think that's uh, uh, something which we see and something which we're welcoming and something which we uh, uh, are working uh, energetically with our partners uh, in China to promote. Okay, Bob, your turn. Can you tell us some? So, so we're a New York-based investor. Mm -hmm. uh, we're focused on financial services. Uh, and what I've seen in the last year in China has been remarkable to me. Um, prior to the financial crisis and in my time at Barclays, we would see um, small investments, um, small shareholding in Western banks um, from many of the sovereign wealth funds and others in China. Now it's very, very direct. It's very targeted. There's a new confidence. Um, I've been in uh, Beijing and Shanghai four times this year, and the entrepreneurial spirit to develop a capital market of private equities, uh, uh, hedge funds, uh, venture capital. So one of our businesses that we've invested in is a financial technology company and an asset management platform. 
and one of the uh, large financial institutions, instead of just investing in our building it, invested, but also has done a memorandum of understanding with us where we're doing a joint venture to develop the asset management local business in China. That's amazing for us to have that access to the domestic market. And it means that the Chinese financial institution is bringing in technology and expertise uh, to build their domestic business. Um, one of the largest banks in China also was our one of our key strategic investors in Atlas Mara, which is our integrated bank in Africa. What was interesting about this is it wasn't really an investment directly in Africa. Uh, we raised equity, and it's on the LSC, so it's on the big board in London. So it was actually an investment through the London Stock Exchange, uh, but giving them access uh, to banking in Africa. And finally, we're, we're beginning to see an interest from a variety of investors in China to work with us to invest directly in Europe, um, where so many of the financial institutions in Europe are spinning off non-core businesses and non-core assets. So it's a very, very different environment than it was five or six years ago. So uh, thank you very much for it, and uh, we have heard the, uh, the, the hopes uh, and uh, visions on China's uh, investment abroad. So uh, the next question will be, the, uh, what are the challenges there is, uh, especially for Minister Davis, and uh, the Africa will be uh, the peak of the uh, next uh, uh, growth, but uh, the, there are diversities in uh, African countries. And, uh, uh, be it a Chinese company or any company from anywhere in the world, what do uh, they need to uh, meet the challenges and what do they should they pay attention to? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, I already started to mention what I think is the common challenge of the African continent. I think the uh, recent uh, uh, oil price uh, shift is uh, simply meaning that oil producing countries are following what many of the rest of us who were uh, involved in the export of other uh, primary mineral products uh, faced a few years ago, and that is that the super prices are no longer with us uh, and that we need to diversify and move up the value chain. What we've got, I think, uh, compared to China is that uh, China had the great advantage of colonialism not dividing it into 54 different countries, which was the fate of the African continent. And so our domestic markets are all too small to support on their own uh, or even to contribute uh, significantly to uh, the, the size of the domestic market that can support and sustain industrial diversification and industrialization. And so we're embarked on some very ambitious regional integration programs, essentially seeking to broaden integration across our existing regional communities, create large markets across the African continent, but also to address a very, very significant infrastructure deficit. The infrastructure deficit exists in particular in infrastructure that links up our economies one to another. In fact, Donald Kabaruka of the African Development Bank has said that that infrastructure deficit is costing uh, our continent uh, the equivalent of 2% uh, growth. Mm -hmm. And so one of the areas where we've been working very strongly through the BRICS framework is the BRICS New Development Bank. Uh, which uh, will now be launched with its headquarters in Shanghai, but the first regional branch office will be located in Johannesburg to serve the African continent. Mm -hmm. And we think that there is a way in which the contributions coming from the BRICS countries, and I think this is very much part of the trend as China being one of the most important BRICS countries, uh, where a capital can now find it, uh, an outlet in uh, productive investments in infrastructure development and so on. Uh, now, I think you're, you're asking another question. We have uh, different uh, legal regimes in place. We have different uh, 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 ways in which we, we work uh, uh, with uh, foreign investors and so on and so forth. But I think what you will see uh, is increasingly that the environment is being made 
more attractive to foreign investors uh, across the board. Uh, and uh, what I think um, uh, uh, investors across the board, including investors from China, need to realize is that many investors are finding that the rewards way out, uh, uh, way, uh, uh, outrun the risks. Uh, it's very well worthwhile looking at the African continent. And many, I think, uh, strategic investors have found that the African continent uh, is indeed uh, the, the next growth frontier. So I think that all of those are things that we're doing to enhance uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the significance of the African continent. And I think we do see Chinese investors among those who are responding. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, we have said, and it's what I was uh, coming at earlier, is we do see a, a greater resonance perhaps uh, in our engagements with China, uh, in understanding our ambitions and our, our development trajectories. And I think that's what uh, uh, we really need to build on. Uh, and I think that could give uh, China a very significant role uh, in the future of, of the development and industrialization of the African continent. Mm. It's very encouraging, inciting, and I think that you mentioned about uh, BRICS uh, Development Bank. Uh, well, we see the complexity of the African continent and uh, uh, the political echo uh, is also very complicated. And if we play the card of uh, a government, and there will be risks. And so you mentioned the uh, international cooperation in terms of uh, BRICS. And uh, apart from that, what will be the more uh, uh, guarantee? to guarantee their success. And I think that this is a very good subject to discuss. And when China goes out to invest, it's all led, uh, mostly is led by the technology companies and together with the government. And uh, the, one of the Chinese uh, companies' uh, characteristics is that they bring about the way of work, uh, the method from China, and they think that uh, it will work in Africa. Uh, but this is a good thing. But we should find out that uh, the project, the completion of the project is important. But what's more important is that uh, we need to um, get the value that we have invested uh, in that project. And I think the Chinese enterprises should uh, uh, pay attention to this. And uh, it's not the uh, end of the job after you completed the project, but also you need to uh, make profit and to get back what you in, uh, you're invested, you have invested. And also, in addition, you need to minimize the political risks by uh, making the benefits, uh, benefits uh, going to the local people. So uh, the uh, interest, common interests uh, should be established with the local people. And in this uh, area, uh, the, there, is a, uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities. So we should uh, establish partnership. And it's not uh, that you reap all the benefits on your own. So any, um, any uh, pro project will be, uh, there will be a risk. So the uh, investment means you um, carry out the projects. And also, we should uh, make this project a good project. And the Chinese government is a strong government. So they could, uh, the, the government can help to resolve uh, many of the problems in the process of carrying out uh, projects. But in the other foreign countries, the, that might not be the case. And secondly, when you uh, make an investment for Chinese, uh, uh, for, for abroad, and it's now at um, uh, the end of the job after you complete the project. And the Chinese, um, uh, the cost of the Chinese project is, is uh, are rather low. But one should think of the uh, whole lifetime of the projects, of your products. And uh, you should think of the, um, the benefit that you would um, uh, give to the local community. So um, in this way, uh, you can become popular among the local 
political population and uh, the thus uh, they will be minimized the political risk. So when you talk about a partnership, you think of the relationship between uh, the Chinese uh, uh, enterprises with the local uh, people. But what are the lo uh, Chinese government relationship between the Chinese uh, uh, enterprises and uh, other companies? So I would like to know that the outbound uh, the Chinese investment, how do we establish this partnership with the, uh, the local countries? And what are the, your experiences in this field? So I think we've talked a little bit about Africa, but I think we're talking a little bit more about Africa. Um, and if you think about financial services mm -hmm. and the opportunity for the Chinese banks to expand into Africa, one way would be to just become more global to build bricks and mortar and branches. And I think for many of the institutions in China, they, they are very cautious about that. Mm -hmm. So they followed a pattern primarily which is following their customers. So the Chinese banks are doing a lot of business in Africa with Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. But they haven't expanded beyond that. So the first case was one of the big banks uh, now owns 20% of Standard Bank. So they have a big stake in one of the banks there, and they can learn more about banking in Africa before they, they expand too far away from the Chinese companies. That's very similar to what one of the big banks, our strategic investor, is doing with us. By in being a strategic investor in us through London, they're learning more about how to run banks on the ground rather than jumping too quickly from um, a Beijing-based or Chinese-based bank mm -hmm. into Africa. And, and to Robert's point, there are 46 different countries, 46 different currencies. Now it's changing. There's really mm -hmm. four key trading blocks. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that they need to learn. And I think what's, what's smart about the investment that the Chinese banks are making in Africa is they're beginning by following their customers customers they know, customers they're comfortable lending to and doing business with, and they're just beginning that next stage, which is investing in, in domestic banks. Thank you. Yifu, I want to hear you. China is the third largest FDI sources. In the future, it will be even bigger. For Chinese companies, the biggest challenge is uh, psychological preparation and talent preparation are far from sufficient. Five to ten years ago, China was talking about how to attract investment. Suddenly, China has become a net investor overseas now. Companies now can't survive now unless they invest overseas. To give you a specific example, I visited a labor-intensive base, Guangdong province, Fujian province, Zhejiang province, Jiangsu and Shandong. You'll be able to see labor-intensive manufacturers started in the 80s with investment from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And most of that has already gone. But indigenous companies find that the profit margin is coming down. It's difficult to employ people. They want to go out of China, but they are scared because the change of environment is happening too fast. Minister said this already. There are 54 countries in Africa. They are all slightly different. And we, as uh, labor-intensive manufacturers, we used to receive orders. We don't really know what's going on outside China. Now you are telling them to move out of China completely. That's a big challenge. I think Chinese companies well, the government said already, leverage resources domestically and internationally and markets domestically and internationally. But we haven't got people to do it. 
This is a major barrier. Well, can I just ask you about this thing? Chinese companies are still thinking about how to invest overseas. The foreign countries will probably think about investment. So is it the multinational companies? Uh, should Chinese companies restructure themselves to become a multinational company? It's not just a Chinese company. It's a transnational company. Is that a stage or process? Well, I think it's a question of, question of mentality. How do you define multinational company? If you are a labor-intensive company, even if they are Chinese-owned, if they go to India or Africa or Latin America, it's not going to be a multinational company. Company. We are talking about big group of companies. They have a whole value chain, both in their own countries and globally, uh, in technology, in finance. It's essentially managed. So this is a different kind of a multinational. Uh, looking ahead, uh, this is not going to be the model for Chinese companies just yet. But Irrespective of that, if you want to invest overseas, you've got to understand the local culture, political context, legal context, and the risks. And there's an issue of uh, language, too. Uh, we are doing it in a hurry, perhaps not like Greek. Okay, you have prepared well. Well, I think you have prepared well, haven't you? Well, i just like to share my view with you. I think uh, being global, how can you become an international company? Uh, one thing is talent. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I think, the mindset needs to be different. We need to think about mutual benefit. You shouldn't just think about how to make money by setting up a, con by setting up a, a factory. You need to bring with you technology, R&D, cost control, quality, among many other things. Made in China often gives people the impression it's a low quality product. It's not a high quality product. That is perhaps some the perception we need to change. I'm from manufacturing. We are in the US, in Europe, and in Africa. We are thinking very hard. How do we set up a factory? What factory to set up? If it's just processing plant, it's no good. It, it's got to be something that can work locally with local economy. And therefore, you need to bring technology, quality, management. So for me, it's much more important to bring your culture a mutually beneficial culture so that people will accept you. But of course, there are big risks. In Brazil, we've been there for 15 years. For the first 10 years, we almost gave up. Uh, plus, well, we talk about corruption in China. China is not alone and pretty bad elsewhere, too. We, 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 we can't control finance. Whatever company you set, uh, you do with the company, if the company is not profitable, then your company has no value. So how do you make money? So the, it's not just price competition. There are other things to, to do well. So first thing is we need to know it's got to be mutually beneficial. For this many years, China is perhaps the best FDI destination. But when we go to other countries, we feel quite strongly. Perhaps it's because our culture clashes with their, theirs. But very often, if you really want to have a, a very transparent operation, that's a hard. We have a challenge there. I can understand that. Excellent. I think uh, the impact cannot be ignored. So perhaps we can ask uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez to talk about the most Mexican situation. Sure, thank you very much. I want to bring again Latin America to the discussion. Okay. Uh, I will start with common understanding and finish with global value chain. You said that, the minister said, common understanding is important. Of course, this is the first step. In this sense, you, sh you should start with the political assessment. Mm -hmm. And this happened between Mexico and China uh, two years ago. President uh, Xi Jinping and President Peña Nieto met and started a roadmap to review all the things needed to have a really strong relationship. <laughs> two weeks ago, Many presidents of Latin America met just uh, President Xi Jinping at the CELAC-China meeting, and also to set the whole 
a roadway to review what, what's needed to have a very strong relation. After that starting of common understanding, I have to say language is of course a barrier, but common understanding goes far beyond only the language. Laws are different, of course, but rules of business are the same. Rule, rules of business are stable between Latin America and China. And in this sense, what is needed to do real business between both areas? You said, of course, we need the financials, currency, peso, yen, Latin American currency, China currency. That's needed that banks establish in our area and Mexican banks or Latin American banks also in China. We just uh, announced that ICBC started operations in Mexico a few months ago. This is very important also that you can uh, handle all the money that flows from one country to the other. Also very important to, to, to this part of engagement is to have solid funds. Uh, China and Mexico are managing a fund uh, managed by IFC, thank you very much. And precisely <laughs> the idea is to enhance the way small and medium-sized businesses can come to Mexico and also go to China to have business. Professor, you just said that it was very hard to change the mind, to change the way you started being one of the uh, FDI incoming uh, countries, and now you have to go and invest. The same happens to Mexico. And this is part of the understanding. We were also very interested in companies investing in Mexico. Of course, we're interested in uh, China investing in Mexico still. But the idea is that we have also this uh, change of mindset. We are also investing in China. And this part of the common understanding is very interesting, so you can uh, have the idea in which areas we are uh, in, in Latin America and in Mexico, and what and w how we can uh, enhance business of both areas. And in this part is the enhancement is the most important one, and it's the personal one. And you can help me with Wang Shi and Mians. Guan Xi, Mianzi. Thank you. Relationship and networking is very important, and that's what we're uh, doing in this moment. I traveled eight, year, uh, eight times uh, past year to China. Uh, I had also my counterparts coming to Mexico, but also with uh, about 500 uh, uh, entrepreneurs going to China, coming to Mexico, and also to all the region to know each other and how they can work and really the mindset is very similar. Mm. I said language is different, but not only the part of uh, the Mianzi, that, that you can have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, that you can know the people, that you can eat their food. This is something that's very important to go through. And in, in this direction, Latin America and China are working very good together. Not stopping that, it's the, last, the global value chain. At the moment, the imports of Mexico of uh, Chinese goods is mainly materials we use to build uh, home appliances or we build uh, cars. And the new in Chinese investment coming to Mexico is precisely not importing that parts, but manufacturing those parts in Mexico and integrating a real value chain between China, Mexico, and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn to the impact of a Chinese investment on the world. Uh, Mr. Yi Fu, in the 80s, uh, American companies were rather shocked by Chinese investment coming over. Now you are talking about the scale of Chinese overseas investment. Uh, it's quite strategic. That will have a big impact on the world, won't it? Uh, could you ex elaborate on that? So, uh, uh, with a view uh, to uh, take, considering what happened in Japan, what will be the major impact next? I think uh, I said Chinese investment overseas is an economic activity based on the law of economics. And therefore, Chinese investment will be beneficial also to destination countries. That's a very important principle, whether it's Africa or Latin America. A lot of that at the moment is into resources, but that's done on the 
basis of economics and um, market principles. The countries with uh, resources receiving Chinese investment benefits from such investment. For example, in the last 10 years, of the fastest developing countries, seven are in Africa. If you look at those seven, many of them are resource intensive. The speed of, de of their development is linked to investment from China. That investment brings finance and GDP growth. The second thing is uh, investment into infrastructure. Developing countries have a big issue in their development, and that is the bottleneck of infrastructure. Without it, trading costs will be high. Some industries uh, are very good in industry. For example, uh, cotton. Uh, trading cost is very important, whether uh, it's China or Southeast Asia or uh, Africa. Uh, investment into infrastructure is China's strength, but it brings benefits to Africa. Uh, this also brings uh, local employment, providing better products with technology content. This is good for the value chain of the local economy, too. So the two trends, one is going to developed countries in order to acquire technology. We know in 2008, developed countries suffered recession. Many countries with technology face bankruptcy because of the overall economic environment. That's a great opportunity for Chinese companies to go and acquire these companies turning companies about to be out of the game into a good company. So China also benefits, it acquires technology, speeds up its own technology upgrading, and also investment into labor-intensive industries. I'd just like to highlight that since the Industrial Revolution, we've seen 250 years of development, barring a few oil and resource big countries. Any country that's gone into middle income and into high income, any of those countries have gone through the process of going from labor intensive into high employment industries. And uh, to change uh, the large number of peasants into uh, uh, working uh, manufacturing uh, population so they could gradually upgrading the industry. And these are the common points uh, from all successful countries. On the other hand, China has such a huge uh, manufacturing point, and this uh, can, can be used, and we can shift part of those manufacturing uh, uh, capability to uh, outside China, and uh, so we could uh, we could take, seize the opportunity that's offered by this uh, golden age. And, uh, for instance, uh, we Chinese company, as a result, can be developed as fast as uh, South, uh, Southeast Asian countries. So the, I think that one of the big uh, contribution that China will make that uh, in the in the end, it will be a joint uh, rapid uh, development in the world. So, Jin Ying, uh, what do you think of uh, uh, China's impact? Um, and uh, if in comparison to uh, the what happened to uh, Japan a few decades ago, uh, I think that. Uh, if, uh, if we take into uh, consideration of what's happened in the history, and uh, we should also take into consideration that uh, China's event investment is rather big, uh, it's, a, uh, it's of a big uh, sca scale, and that's different from uh, uh, the uh, many decades ago. And uh, I think that the good, uh, green uh, company has, uh, has already mentioned this, and China 
among all the all the opportunities, uh, China will have uh, uh, more op op opportunities. Uh, be, uh, whether it, it is a, a developed country uh, or the developing country, uh, they are facing challenges. Uh, for instance, developed countries are facing uh, challenges of a deflation. And, uh, China's in, in, investment uh, will lay a foundation for some countries' uh, uh, economic growth. So I think there are uh, really a lot of opportunities. And uh, China has, it has been a long time that China has made, uh, started to make an investment in, uh, abroad. And um, uh, the uh, Chairman of the Board of Green has mentioned about a, a common mutual beneficial. And so, Minister Davis, yeah, I think I, I please go to ahead. Say is that I think that um, China emerging as a major investor, it needs to be understood if we're talking about uh, emerging economies, the African continent, that uh, you're not the only ones. Uh, that there are many other uh, investors that are beginning to see that uh, they need to move an increasing proportion of their investments uh, into mm -hmm. these areas, mm -hmm. uh, including investors coming from the developed world, uh, including investors coming from elsewhere in Southeast Asia, other BRICS countries I've mentioned as well. And uh, so I think that uh, the environment is becoming much more competitive. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of the recipients, that's no bad thing. Uh, and it enables us to, uh, well, you know, pick the best. Uh, and I think that some of the things that have been said about, uh, by way of advice, about understanding the local environment, relationships and things like that, I think those are, are, are where the competition will be. Uh, it's not going to be just about uh, financials. It's going to be about who is going to be relating to the developmental projects of the country and, and region concerned, uh, who is going to be creating employment, who is going to be raising skills, uh, and all of those kinds of things. So I think that uh, it's, uh, it's very important to partner with uh, the, uh, the, the, the objectives, I mean, what Justin mm -hmm. outlined. Uh, no one has actually gone from being an underdeveloped or a poor country to being a rich country without diversifying and adding more value. Uh, there are global value chains. Uh, are we going to continue to be the recipients of finished goods? Uh, or are we going to be uh, involved in value chains and producing some part of the finished goods that we consume? I think those are the critical questions. And if uh, Chinese companies position themselves appropriately in that competition, uh, then they've got a very, very good opportunity. Uh, one of the things that Chinese companies have is they carry no historical baggage, uh, which is a very, very great advantage uh, in the uh, developing world, the post-colonial world. So I think that uh, all of that uh, does create some opportunities, but it also does mean uh, that things uh, have to happen. And uh, something that we've learned as uh, South African companies in the rest of Africa, that uh, our companies may carry their own brands, but whether they like it or not, they also carry another brand, and that is of the country concern. So if we have a people that sully the national brand name, uh, that's also a problem as well. So I think that uh, there is a, uh, a need to, to, to uh, watch the quality, okay. the way in which uh, these investments mm -hmm. uh, relate uh, to uh, national uh, and even uh, regional or continental uh, developmental aspirations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you want to, ha want to add anything uh, from the other three? Impacts. Do you want to add anything? Yes. Thank you very much. I think that in, in the case with China, for example, there are also the, the, the area of services. In this case, uh, the approach of both presidents two years ago brought many ideas to the table, and one of those was communications. In fact, we are the only Spanish-speaking country with a direct flight to China. Mm -hmm. And this brings also more Chinese people to work in the area of services and the, the service-related okay. uh, companies. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, we are very interested in opening sectors like infrastructure, mm -hmm. like communications, like energy. Uh, mm -hmm. These three uh, new areas uh, in which uh, Chinese companies can work together with Mexican companies is also very interesting. They can come alone, 
where they can find a partner. And we think that this is a challenge. We will see many, many good news in, in, in the papers in the next uh, weeks, months, years, mm -hmm. because it's working. Huawei just announced 1.5 billion uh, investment. Uh, there was also one uh, the, the, in the, the railroad, that the high-speed railroad that will yeah. be moving from Mexico City to Querétaro. The tender was as, uh, opened uh, two days, four days ago. Then we will be really looking forward for the next generation of Chinese investments in Mexico. Mm -hmm. We already are working with manufacturing. We are already working with parts for, for consumer okay. parts, and this is very interesting. Okay, uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, well, uh, because of the time, I would uh, like to allow some questions from an audience. Uh, so uh, I will give you two questions, and uh, please uh, introduce yourself when you raise hands. Who has uh, the question? I would uh, pose this question to uh, Professor Lin. You emphasize that uh, it's important to have an uh, infrastructure, uh, but there is another saying that in the developing countries to invest uh, on infrastructure, this is a, a less disadvantage point, and it's not that you can be successful uh, when you have the will to do it. And, uh, even countries like Germany, they haven't uh, had the supporting system for uh, building the infrastructure. This is a crucial question. And I wanted to say any investment has uh, risks. Uh, it's not only uh, investment on, in, in, on infrastructure. And uh, the green uh, group had uh, risks in Brazil. But firstly, you should have a, a rationalization of the economy. And uh, if you, you can, uh, from the point of view of the economies, you don't have a, a logic, then you cannot make money. And also, when I was working in World Bank, there is a, a MIGA, a multi-investment insurance uh, me mechanism, and you need to uh, buy it. And uh, so some of the uh, risks you can sell out, and uh, some of the risks, uh, the investment that without uh, risk you can buy. So this is uh, one way to diversify the risks. And I think if in this way, you could uh, guarantee the investment's return, and uh, the political risk can be redu reduced too. <clears throat> we have another question from here. In China, one often hears that outbound investment will have a boomerang effect uh, in China. And so my question to you, as China is trying to become more of a service sector economy and more knowledge intensive economy, how will outbound investment contribute uh, to those kinds of transformations within China? I think uh, you should answer this question. Uh, so how can we uh, shift this out? But in the uh, reprocessing, and those uh, among this, the high value ones, for instance, the brand, the management, and the R&D, and this can be kept in China. So in all the, uh, in the practices of the uh, history, uh, for instance, uh, the 1960s Japan and 1980s uh, four dragons in the in Asia, they all did this. Uh, so. Uh, from the manufacturing point of view, we should have a, a more service-oriented part. Uh, that means so we need to uh, you, uh, making the existing uh, manufacturing product, production lines into uh, uh, more oriented, uh, service-oriented. Uh, if you uh, raise the living standards, 
um, of the people, and uh, then you will have the opportunities. On the, on the other hand, uh, with the development of the uh, production, uh, there will be more complexity in terms of uh, R&D. So I think the outbound investment is beneficial for China to uh, have a, a more, um, so, so your, a more um, necessary. Um, you have I think the investment that um, the Chinese bank did with our asset management and financial technology platform was only done in, in conjunction with a memorandum of understanding where we're doing a joint venture in the domestic market. So by investing in a firm that's incorporated in New York, they're bringing some of the skills and some of the technology back to their home market as well. And I think it's a, it's a very good example of how a uh, investment into a financial services organization in, in, in New York is benefiting the domestic uh, okay. economy. Thank you. Uh, so I have about 30 seconds. I want uh, uh, I, everybody to make a conclusion. I want you to make a conclusion. I think that uh, we have the already the integration of the economies in the world. And uh, uh, some more advanced countries, uh, maybe they are different from ours. So we, uh, we should firstly have the mutual beneficial um, concept. And uh, secondly, you need to improve the living standards of the local people. Thirdly, you should make a contribution to uh, the, uh, to the uh, local environment, uh, the local economy. So China is a big investor, and I think this uh, will be the new beginning for the world. Thank you, and uh, that's it for today. Uh, we would like to thank you for your time.